in the last lecture, we talked about the modern state, the rise of the modern state, and <coughs> what uh, we talked about several definitions, what a state actually is, and we made the important distinction between state and nation, <coughs> which sometimes are uh, used interchangeably um, here because of a specific development of uh, the understanding of nationhood in the United States, um, because it is linked to citizenship, as we discussed. So, we talked about state, we talked about nation, we talked about what the political system is and what the government is. And all these are very important concepts that from now on you are expected to use them correctly. Do not <coughs> misunderstand, do not uh, use one concept instead of the other. Concepts in political science are, are tools of, of knowledge, of understanding. And knowing politics, knowing political science means knowing the exact meaning of terms and using them correctly. That's Two uh, in, in you know in uh, <coughs> political sciences in other bran branches of knowledge definitions concepts are are tools of knowledge uh, and unless we use them correctly it clearly knowledge is not um, perfect yet so today in a shorter lecture uh, we will cover the various ways in which the modern state can be organized uh, there are that many ways. And we will also talk a little bit about the functions that the modern state is supposed to accomplish, this very powerful entity that is the state, right, the modern state. And we will also discuss briefly <coughs> about the major components of uh, uh, democratic political systems uh, in modernity today. So the, the way in which the institutions of the state are arranged uh, how democracies, the, the basic principles of modern representative democracies. Then, during the week, we will look at uh, the United States, we will look at the United Kingdom, we will look at France, and we will look, we will look at Germany to see how this actually happens, and from then we will draw uh, other definitions and a typology of various types of democratic political systems. But for now, for now, uh, let's just uh, start with discussing the, discussing the various ways in which a state uh, can be organized today. So what is a state? Let's remember the definition. A state is a set of institutions that exercise sovereign power right, over a territory and a membership. <coughs> right? So we, that means that there is a set of institutions, I don't know how many and so on and so on, which control a territory. This is why we usually associate states with boundaries, because of, of this principle of sovereignty over a territory, but also membership. We talked about the fact that the members might not actually be within those boundaries, right? And what are these members called? Citizens. Now, the major, the broad typology, and when I'm, when I'm going to ask you, if I'm going to ask you, for example, <coughs> What can you tell me about the state of France, right, the state? Right? You're going to have to answer by referring to how the state is organized in France. And there are three, ways, three major ways to organize it. And what is this about? It's about where is this power, where is power, this unique power to govern the territory and, and the membership, where is it located? So basically, where is sovereignty? which is this exclusive power, right, to remember our definition. Where is sovereignty located? And there are three, three different ways. The most, the simplest one, and actually this is the French model, is a unitary state. So a unitary state, as the <coughs> name says it, has a un... Uh, um, well, it's united, right, in the sense that it is governed as a whole by one source of power, right? Which means that sovereignty is located where in the central national government. So all power over the state is in the national government. This is what makes the state unitary. It is the national government that governs France all the, by constitution all the sovereignty is located with the national government. Now, the national government might delegate parts of this, parts of the sovereignty, meaning might allow other entities other levels of government to exist. It might allow for mayors. It might allow for departments or counties, right, uh, with their own government. So it might allow 
levels of government within the territory. But the power that these levels of government have comes, comes from the central government. Right? The central government giveth, the central government taketh away, or can take away, at least in principle. Right? Even if actually some of these cities, as we know from history now, pre-existed this, this uh, centralized government. So this is uh, the central government. So this is, <coughs> this is a key way of organizing the state, one that is very common. It's typical for the modern state that all the power is in the hands of the central government and it just regards it and might delegate it in the sense of allows other levels of government to govern various parts of the territory, uh, but in fact, constitutionally, in the DNA of the system, the state is unitary. The second, uh, another model of, uh, of the, uh, assigning sovereignty of organizing the state is the federal model. And obviously you know this because it's the model that is used in this state, meaning the United States of America, which is one state. <coughs> and this model does what? Sovereignty in a federal state is divided. Sovereignty is assigned to two different levels of government at the same time. Which means that sovereignty doesn't belong to the central government, the national government, nor does it belong only to the regional government, but it is distinctly divided between the two. So you, this is why you have a national government and in a federal state, meaning a state that is organized federally. Note how we're using these concepts. Note how we're using these concepts because they're not necessarily how they're used in common day parlance in the United States, right? We call states here what are actually regions, provinces. These, these are not states, they are regions, provinces. There is a reason for this, right? And we'll talk about this when we get to the United States, to the case study. <coughs> but for now, understand that when we talk about state, it's not the states like Virginia or Washington or Oregon or, and so on. State is well, we define the state, right? The United States of America is a state. So, in a federal system of government, sovereignty is divided between a national and a regional level of government. So, how does it work? This is strange. Eh? How do you divide sovereignty? And you know, you have the constitution um, in which this is described, right? But in practice, how does it work? Well, the way it works in practice is that Jim our friend Jim, his life, right? Let's say this is Jim's life, all the things that he does, right? From daily to special things to marriage, all the aspects of his life throughout life, right? Well, how does government do it? Governs, of course, right? Meaning it makes laws, right? Over aspects of the life. Well, Jim, if you are Jim and live in the state of Washington, which you might be, although your, your name might not be Jim, let's say this is the state of Washington, well Jim here lives under two governments, which means that two governments decide separately, separately, that's very important, two distinct governments decide separately over his life. Well, hi, how do they do that? Don't they squabble? No, because, well, they do, but in theory they shouldn't, because the national government governs certain aspects of Jim's life, while the state government here, right, the regional government, governs other aspects of Jim's life. Public order, uh, even elections, education, health, uh, local business, all these, as you know, marriage is governed by what? The regional government here in the United States. While, so sovereignty, in as much as it refers to these aspects of life, is given to the regional government. Sovereignty, this, uh, exclusive power, in as much as it re regards foreign matters, interstate commerce, right? Other aspects that are of national importance is given, that part of power is given to the national government. Okay? So this is how Jim lives under two governments. Because one part of his life is governed by the regional government, another part of his life is governed by the national government. This is why sovereignty is distinctly, right, uh, <coughs> given to both the national and the regional uh, level of government. Split. Sovereignty is split between these. And they coexist. 
Now, of course, in a federal system, usually the national government has a sort of a priority over the regional government, but however, there are distinct powers given to each. Now, a third major uh, type is the confederal. That was the federal, this is the confederal. And this, of course, also you should know because from in the United States, <coughs> the history of the United States, this was the model initially. This was the model. This was supposed to be the model. So, so if in the unitary state all power is given to the central government, and it can delegate it, right? in a federal system, power, uh, sovereignty is split between central, national, and regional levels of government. In a confederal level, it's the opposite of the unitary. In a confederal level, all the power, all of it, is given to the regional units of government. And these regional units of government have full sovereignty. So what happens next? What, what, what does it make it come federal? Are they just like many states that live alone with sovereignty? Yes. But what makes it come federal is that they choose to delegate aspects of this power, of this sovereign power that, that, that they uniquely have to a central level of government. But they delegate this and they can take it away. They give us, they can take it away. So you see, it's the reverse of the unitary system. And of course, these are theoretical models. None of that, none of them actually exist in a pure essence, right? But they come very close to describing the situation. So the situation is always more complex because this is human life. But the confederal model, well, can we give an example of this? Well, Switzerland is a confederacy. Although, yeah, Switzerland is a confederacy the confederal, uh, you know, United States of uh, America, the original way in which they were indeed independent states and they delegated certain attributions to a central level of government which was very weak, which is why the whole thing failed, right? Some people would say that the European Union comes close to a confederal level, and I think that's quite persuasive because these states are sovereign, but certain functions they have delegated, but, well, we'll talk about the European Union uh, at the end of the course briefly. So this is the confederal. All sovereignty is given to the regional levels, but they can decide to delegate it to a central level. So unitary, federal, confederal, it's not that difficult. But you need to understand when I ask about the state, how it is organized, you have to choose one of these um, <coughs> uh, formats. Okay. Now, uh, the unitary state, and this is, I'm not, so let's close that chapter. Let's pause and let's move on. Because I want you to distinguish what I'm trying to say, what I'm going to say now from what I just presented. In a unitary state, like France, as you'll see, the degree to which that, first of all, sovereignty is given completely to the national level of government. Right? It owns all the power, which it can delegate to. So it allows for a mayor of Paris to exist, right? For city council of Marseille, right? Or whatever. <coughs> now, the level to which this central power is delegated to lower levels of government, delegated, not given away. Delegated means you can take it away. You can take it back. So the level to which this central power is delegated to lower levels of, of government, the level to which this central government decides, acknowledges, and decides to give away of its power, delegating it, right? although it is remain sovereign, that's the difference between centralized state or decentralized state. Right? Another word for decentralized is devolution. And that is the giving away of power, well, delegating, right? It's not given forever. Delegating power from the central government in a unitary state towards regional levels of government. That's decentralization, that's devolution. Right? Centralization means is whether you take away power or you or the central government keeps as much power as possible and local levels of government are very weak. Right? But this is all happening in a lot 
the uni, the real state. This is never, no matter how decentralized it is, it's never federal. Federal is this different. Federal by constitution splits sovereignty between two levels, distinct levels of government. This is a delegation. Centralized, decentralized. Or devolution. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, right, we talked about state, political system, government. And what is a, 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 a state is a set of set a state is a set of institutions in power over territory and membership. A political system is how those institutions are arranged, the relationships that exist between them, uh, the degree of power each has, and the processes that, that function between them. A government, right, is simply the people who are in charge of the political system, who are in the positions of powers within this political system. So, state, political system, government, right? <coughs> deep, less deep, more superficial. Because governments you can change through an election, political systems, well, the way the whole system is arranged, that's a constitutional change or a, or a revolution. States to be changed needs, you know, changing borders, invasion, right? Means um, the state falling apart, means um, secession, right? Now, in terms of the modern state, which we discovered how powerful the reality it is because it makes everyone equal by force, whether you like it or not. And nobody asks you if you want to be equal citizen with others. So the state, for a state to, 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 to survive through its political system, through its government, or rather the government through the political system and which are the tools of the state, any government, right, any state needs to deliver certain things. Right? What allows for the state to remain is that it not only imposes power, which it, which it does, but in terms of what it needs to deliver, the two, well, the most important thing is security. No matter what kind of a political system you have, whether it's democratic or non-democratic, it could be a dictatorship, a totalitarian regime, authoritarian regime, or a democracy, it doesn't matter. Whichever you have, you need to deliver security. Even a dictator needs to deliver security to its people. In what sense? With what kind of security? Well, one is physical, and the other one is economic. People put up with dictatorship as long as they have, they can live. And in order to live, they need to have a physical security, which can be, uh, you know, from protecting the borders to maintaining law and order, right? to pro providing minimal health, right, to the conditions to, to, to live, and economic because you need to be able to provide for yourself and for your family. And no matter what sort of an arrangement you have, democratic or non-democratic, Saddam Hussein or, or uh, uh, you know, Barack Obama, doesn't matter who, which, who is in charge, which government, and what kind of a system they rule over. From Iran to China, whether it's communism to democracy in Canada. What they, they all need, in order to survive, they need to deliver security, physical or economic. Your book has a different list, and I, I encourage you to, to know that as well. Your book talks about security, stability, and prosperity as the three major things that uh, uh, the state, meaning the state through its political system, meaning the government in charge of the whole thing, what they need to deliver. And uh, you can look through the, through the book to look at how uh, it explains what security means, what stability means, and what prosperity means. Uh, however, in order to, you know, recognize a state, you know, we look at, we talk about failed states, which are basically states that don't do this, which are basically states that don't control the territory and so on. We also usually nowadays, besides expecting the states to uh, deliver these things and to have this exclusive control over territory and membership, right? If a state doesn't have that, it's not a state, right? Uh, for example, Somalia. You can go to Somalia. That, that's what we call a failed state because there is no set of institutions that you can point to that actually has control of the territory and of the people. This is what we, what we call chaos or whatever. Right? What we mean by chaos is there is no leviathan over the territory and the membership. 
What we want is to be under the Leviathan. And that's our model, right? This is what, why? Because this is what gives us order and freedom and security. Indeed, freedom. We talk about freedom, but freedom is actually granted by whom? It is granted by the state. Wh why? Because it's laws that grant freedom and also put, define that freedom. You know, this is not anarchy. This is not lack of government. So a failed state is one that fails to be a state, to control the territory and the membership. And the sign that you see, uh, that uh, the best sign for this, as you will see in, uh, if, if you go to Somalia, is that there are no roads, for example. Because, which shows you that the state's reach does not extend over this territory. Because there are no roads, there are no cops on the streets. The elements, the, 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 the signs of state presence, because this is what it means to, to, to govern uh, the state is to both maintain law and order, security in the physical sense, but also economic, to provide for the means of uh, existence, to build roads, right, to protect the borders, uh, to, to enforce the law with, with cops. All these are instruments of the state. Right? But there's another thing that nowadays we kind of expect from a state in order to consider it legitimate. But, you know, you can't really, you know, every state is a state in as much as it has this sovereign power. Doesn't matter what it is. But somehow, in be you know, behind, it, there is also a need, an uh, additional expectation, which uh, someone somehow lurks behind our mind. And this expectation is about the political system. We kind of expect the political system not only to deliver these things, but also we expect it to be democratic. But what is a democracy? And here I'm just going to give you the, 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 the basic uh, building blocks of a modern representative democracy because then we'll see how the variety of how these things can be arranged in distinct forms through our case studies of the United States, United Kingdom, France and Germany. So modern representative democracies, remember from now, right? What is a representative democracy and why is it a representative democracy? Representative democracy, the word tells it, is based on the idea of representation. This is not direct democracy. In the Greek city-state you had all the citizens participating in the actual act of government, taking legislative decisions, being part of the executive. All the citizens, basically, in principle. Yeah? We are not a direct democracy. Direct democracy was shunned, for example, by the framers of the American Constitution. What we have in the world is a representative democracy. But what is the essence of democracy? Is that people, what is the people, which people, the citizens of course, not all people or any people. The people, what, govern themselves. That's what we think democracy is, because it's from Greek, it's from demos, kratos, the power, kratos, of the people, demos. It's the rule of the people. So here's the people and really they're supposed to what? Rule themselves. Self-governance. Yeah? That's what we think democracy is. But because it's representative democracy, they don't. It's not the people here and the people here. That's direct democracy. It is the people sending delegates, representatives, who then rule the people. But it's because they are their representatives, they're supposed to rule in their interests and represent their ideas and other such. Now, there are, uh, what are the major functions in a representative uh, democracy? The major functions that uh, a political system needs to uh, accomplish, the major roles. Well, think of luck, right? What were the things that we delegated, or what were the things for which we entered into a social compact, social contract, right? We established a government in order, by delegating the power to what? Pass laws, because over us all, together, execute those laws or implement those laws over us together, and also arbitrate, adjudicate when there are conflicts between us or between the laws themselves. Right? So there are three major functions. The legislative, right, which the government does. I don't legislate for you all. We all elect the government to legislate over us. Right, that's the logic of the social contract. We elect a government to govern us. Legislative, executive, which is the 
power of executing laws, implementing laws, and judiciary, which is the power to arbitrate, to adjudicate conflicts between laws, between individuals, between actors. So these are what? These are the three branches that today we consider of the government because they're the three functions of the government. Do these need to be separate together? Now here's the difference. It, they don't have to be separate. Or they don't have to be together. This is where, di this is why we have different types of political systems. All democratic. They all respond to this principle, right, of, se of representation and their governance by representatives, right? They respond to this principle, and we're going to talk about other criteria for democracies, but <coughs> for representative democracies, um, but the way these functions are distributed, who does what and, and, and so on, and which one is more powerful or more influential, that varies. And this is the typology, the, the various, uh, varied typology of political systems, democratic political systems. And the major types of political systems, of democratic political systems, are actually only three, three major types. Now your book mentions two more, and you're welcome to, to uh, uh, know them. We will go to the case studies, and at the end of the case studies, we will do an overview of these um, different types, because in the case studies, you will see how each of them works. So we're going to learn these different major types. When you establish a democracy today, you're going to choose one of these types. It's that simple. So <coughs> these being presidential, parliamentary, semi-presidential, but we'll see. So back here, what I want you to notice is that here's the people, or the state, right, in the sense of the territorial membership. This is a set of institutions ruling over the state. And there are three major functions that this set of institutions needs to accomplish. One is legislative, the other one is executive, and the other one is judiciary. Now, who, where do we send our representatives? Well, first of all, we send them into the leg legislative branch, into the legislature. And usually, all democracies have to have, right, um, a body where the representatives meet to do what? Pass laws. Because it's the, our representatives who will pass laws over us. Right? And that's the legislature. This is why it's called the legislature, because it fulfills this people legislating themselves through representatives. But then you also need to have a branch that does what? Executes, implements laws, runs the country, runs the, 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 the entire, all those institutions, the cops, the borders, the, the roads. Those are institutions because they need to be sets of people pursuing these, these jobs every single day. Yeah? That's in the charge of the executive, right? What sort of relationship exists between these? Well, that's, that's where the different political systems are formed, because there are different types of relationships. H how do we choose them? The exact members of the executive, for example, how do we choose these? Right? Th these are all the details, the details that we will study. And then we have the judiciary, which manages conflicts between these branches, conflicts between the laws that are passed. These are laws. You see, representatives produce laws, or action, rather. We'll talk more about this. So this is the judiciary. And it is somewhat outside of it, right? Because it needs to, to, to be able to settle conflicts. Now how these branches are arranged and work together are going to be the three major types of democratic political systems that we will study through case studies of the United States, United Kingdom, France, and Germany. Thank you.